can build new boats and simply sell to the next ocean when there is um, deficient. PNA's initial agreement was signed 30 years ago and spans a generation. And in that time, PNA has been at the forefront of shaping international fisheries management. PNA leads with conservation and management, including through our vessel day scheme as our primary effort control mechanism. <coughs> and recently, the PNA Free School Skipjack Fishery was granted MSC certification, the Marine Steward Council certification. PNA shares the goals and aspirations of everyone in this room. We are, also, we are resource owners, as are many of you in this room. We want to see the tuna fishery sustainable. PNA have been advocating for some time now, and we do not simply want to be bystanders. We also want to participate in the fishery. The global community has been talking about the special aspirations of small island developing states for some time now. And the PNA are working together to make these aspirations a reality. We accomplish this through cooperation and other regional bodies or co cooperation with other regional bodies and by instituting strong conservation measures in our waters. Instead of operating in a vacuum, PNA has embraced its relationships with other Pacific inter intergovernmental bodies, including the Foreign Fisheries Agency, the Secretariat of the Pacific Community, and the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission. The primary management tool, the Vessel Day Scheme, has been the most significant transform transformative agent in this fishery in recent years. Our VDS is both an excellent sustainability tool, but also an economic instrument. And for our part of the world, it works for now. The application of this rights-based instrument has entrenched the rights of the PNA strengthened their bargaining role in access negotiations and created a favorable market. The PNA have instituted a number of other measures over the past 30 years, which are binding measures under international law. Measures include a four-month flat closure, recently increased from three months to four months, um, ICS pocket closure, to vessels that are licensed to fish in the EEZs of the PNA. 100% observer coverage on all vessels that fish in PNA waters and 100% catch retention. In addition, PNA have instituted measures providing setting on whale sharks, imposing a, mesh, a minimum mesh size for per se nets, and provision Oh, and prohibiting fishing by licensed person in the high seas around or between 170 degrees east and 150 degrees west and 10 degrees north and 20 degrees south. So what are the impacts of PNA measures on global tuna market? We know that the proportion of the catch in PNA waters relative to the total catch in WCP Western and Central Pacific Ocean is about 70% of the total. And skipjack catch in PNA waters is about 50% of global skipjack catches. Hence, the leverage that PNA has to manage and effectuate conservation for skipjack, catch, for skipjack cannot be underestimated. PNA may be insignificant land masses and small populace, but has clearly influenced conservation in our region. In closing, the decisions taken by the PNA have implications locally, regionally, and globally. The PNA skipjack fishery is an example of the sustainable management of an international tuna fishery, which has been driven by the resource owners rather than the resource extractors. Shifting the paradigm of fisheries management in our waters has not been easy, nor is it near complete. While we have come a long way, 
we still have far to go. And thank you very much. Thank you. Dwayne, is it on? <laughs> yes, it's on. They're laughing. Yes. Yeah, what we're going to do, we have a video, but I think in the interest of time, and I'm sure you have a lot of questions, I'm going to open it up for questions now. And I think the way it works is you have to go up to that microphone, or maybe if somebody walks around with the microphone, whatever's easier. Katie, do you want to do it, or, or she's going to do it? Okay, so first I want to thank all the speakers, and I think there's a lot of... Uh, Food for thought and a lot of uh, tuna for thought, and I, I hope that you have some questions that will stimulate some good discussion. So, who would like to go first? Yes. And when you, over on the left, and then, Shinko, is your hand up? Okay. <laughs> Please introduce yourself, even if I know you, everyone else may not know you. Okay. Um, hello, <laughs> my name is Jihan Park. Uh, I'm a South Korean advisor, and this spring, all the spring, I have worked for research of tuna, uh, tuna market of Korea in cooperation with Greenpeace Korea. And uh, during this research, I was I had so many difficulties because, as some of you, as some of you know that. In relation to tuna catch and exchange, and all kinds of data are not in are not accurate. It was really really a big problem. So the first uh, provider of the presentation, she said that Korea is the third largest catch, represents the third largest catch and the fourth largest consumption of tuna globally. No. Other way around. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. But uh, from my research, I have gathered all the data from the Korea's fishery, fishery fishing companies organization and the government statistics. All I have searched for all of the data. And then from my, from my research, Korea now ranks second globally uh, catch of tuna and third consumption, largest consumption of tuna. So I have, anyhow, I have also read the report of FAO on tuna market, global market, and in this report also there was mentioned that there is a, there is not a accurate take data. And also from my research also, in many cases, Korean tuna catch and data, they included bill fishes also. So there was very, very confusing. So how can we assume? How can we? How can we make an assumption to uh, set a FA a to set TAC or catch limit based on this inaccurate exact inaccurate data? That was my question. Um, it's, it's a reasonable question, and here's my answer: is that um, it, we all know that there will always be significant data challenges. There will always be significant data challenges when we're dealing with natural systems and variability and the um, challenges of uh, intergovernmental cooperation and being reliant on what data is provided. However, I think that um, time and time again we can see examples all over the um, natural resource management movement. We have to come up with systems that allow us to um, put limits in place even when we have imperfect data and imperfect in fact, the UN Fish Stocks Agreement, when it was adopted, and I don't remember the exact year, but one of the things that it actually specifically talks about is the, the principle of um, precautionary approach. Um, and the idea is, behind that, is that even when the data is imperfect, and even when you don't have every piece of certainty, you have to be able to make decisions. And in, the, in those cases, we have to step back and take a precautionary approach. I think what we've clearly seen, if you look at the state of tuna fisheries, is that although we can look at skipjack and say that it's okay, generally speaking for now, we look at the state of bluefin and we look at the state of big eye, and in some cases we start to raise questions about yellowfin, and even now in the Pacific for the first time, scientific advice is that we need to pay attention to the level of catches that are in place. 
the answer to your question, in my view, is that we have to take a precautionary approach and recognize that a lack of all of the data that we need is not a good enough excuse for, for not putting limits in place. Because otherwise we will spend 10, 20 years arguing about the data, and by the time we come to conclusions about it, there'll be nothing left to manage. So we have to take the best available science and data that we have now and put precautionary limits in place. Oh, do you want to pass the microphone to Otasan? Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Shingo Oka from the Fisheries Agency of Japan. Uh, I, I, I must admit that uh, there are many programs involved in the uh, fishery uh, tuna management uh, as presented by uh, four speakers. And, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all those speakers uh, to make a presentation. And, uh, so those presentations have uh, very good points, whereas uh, to me, uh, some points are a little bit misleading and a uh, little bit obsolete information, but I, may, uh, I must admit that there are many programs involved in the fishery management of the fisheries. But uh, at the same time, uh, I'd like to say that uh, it would be a little bit pity if uh, people here will leave this room with the impression that uh, there are many programs with no progress. Actually, there are having many good progress, or well, at least Japan has been making efforts to uh, make progress. Uh, taking the example of uh, uh, Atlantic Bulletin Tsuna, you know, the, Japan has been trying to reduce TSC uh, in line with the uh, scientific recommendation of the ICAT CRS, and uh, it has been reduced. And uh, I agree with Bruce that uh, uh, it's not enough, uh, low, low enough to. Uh, achieve uh, recovery of stock in a uh, short time. And actually, I got the uh, current objective is to recover the stock uh, by 2022, 10 years from now, or it may be too long. But uh, you know, the, at the same time, you have to be realistic. You know, there are many, many fishermen involved in the fishery, and uh, it's easy to say that uh, we should close the fishery immediately to recover stock. But uh, it's not politically realistic. So we have to find a solution. We have to find a compromise between the sustainability and the economic viability of fishermen. So that's, uh, the, that, that's why I have came up with a uh, uh, little bit uh, you know, the uh, long goal. But uh, I, I can tell you that uh, we are actually uh, approaching uh, to that goal slowly, gradually. I hope so, I really hope so. So, uh, and also, you know, the, uh, you know, the Japan has been criticized as the biggest uh, you know, importing market of Atlantic Blue in Tsuna. And uh, you know, we uh, made great efforts to introduce a uh, so-called uh, catch documentation scheme for Kulkin Tsuna. And uh, at the same time, we have been monitoring the import of Kulkin Tsuna. And uh, we provided uh, uh, several papers that I kept uh, pointing out that there are uh, you know, the uh, non-compliance uh, involved in ICAT fishery. And actually, we have been telling uh, you know, several ICAT members, such as EU or Turkey or Chinese, that uh, you are doing wrong things. And uh, because of this, you know, sometimes they have to release lots of fish from the KG. Uh, and uh, I think lots of uh, you know, positive things have been happening. You know. So at least uh, I think I'd like people here to recognize that uh, you know, the, uh, at least some members are making efforts and uh, they're having good progress. And uh, talking about uh, plastic bullfin tuna, uh, I think the, uh, uh, Dr. Katsukawa's presentation is right, but at the same time, as I said, you know, we have been making uh, efforts. For example, you know, the, uh, uh, as he presented, uh, you know, the, this is a classified uh, species, and uh, last June, uh, you know, the Japan uh, successfully passed in Mexico to accept uh, PSC for Pacific Blue Tuna. For the time, first time in the last three or four years, we have been you know, telling them to accept something, but. Uh, Mexico always denied, but this year they changed their mind, they accept it. And uh, this is uh, you know, one of the examples for progress. And also, you know, the, as Dr. Katsukawa explained, you know, we, ha we are uh, having a uh, you know, uh, stakeholder meeting. Because there are so many small scale fishermen as well as uh, passing fishermen catching blue in Japan. So it's politically very difficult to, you know, yeah, to force them to accept drastic measures. But uh, we, uh, we certainly understand the current situation is not enough, and we have to make more progress. 
That's why we are having a meetings and we are trying to introduce more, you know, the concrete measures for improving the status of passive protein tuna. So, uh, and also, yeah, coming back to the point made by Amanda, like uh, the coverage of long-line uh, fish investors, and the coverage is five percent. I agree, it's not enough, and uh, we should increase. But uh, you know, at the same time, you know, the, uh, there is a uh, logistical difficulties for them to accept, uh, you know, observers on board because of the voyage is three months, four months, five months. You know, sometimes very difficult. So uh, we are taking a step-by-step -step approach, you know, starting from 5%, collecting data, and if 5% is not enough, you have to demonstrate and tell them that 5% is not enough, you have to increase observer coverage, you know. So, uh, we are certainly envisaging, you know, uh, possibly increase of observer coverage in the future, but uh, we have to be very persuasive to our vision, because it involves uh, logistical, <laughs> economic, and so on. And uh, lastly, uh, uh, Charlie's uh, presentation. You know, the, when the countries were considering the uh, introduction of VDS, I actually made a presentation saying that uh, it's okay for you to introduce VDS, but uh, you shouldn't abolish your uh, limitation of passing numbers, 205. But actually, the countries abolished 205. Okay, what happened? The number of passing fishing vessels has been increasing and increasing. And we are very much concerned about the increase of uh, passing fishing vessels in the western central Pacific Ocean. And we are telling, and uh, actually Japan has been freezing the number of uh, passengers uh, operating in the western central Pacific Ocean at 35 for many years. And we are telling uh, other partners such as uh, Taiwan or China not to increase the passing uh, fishing vessels. But the problem is, you know, the, uh, for example, in the case of Taiwan, you know, the, there are two types of Taiwanese fleets. One is flagged to Taiwan, another is flagged to other countries under the Taiwanese investment. And this is a problem, problematic, problematic part, not only in the Pacific Ocean, but also in the Indian Ocean. When you look at, in the, look at the Indian Ocean uh, fisheries, there are many, many Tsunarong large scale Tsunarong liners flagged to developing countries. But actually, almost all of them are Taiwanese, Taiwanese investment. Flag to Seychelles, flag to Malaysia, flag to Indonesia. You know, the many large scales are actually under the influence of Taiwanese investment, and the Taiwanese government cannot control all those fishing vessels. So, you know, the, uh, we certainly understand that uh, we have to, you know, address the legitimate interests of developing countries. You know, so-called aspiration of developing their own fisheries. But sometimes, you know, the, uh, there is a you know, the uh, certain things behind the scene, you know, the, uh, when we consider this is a developing country is a fishery, it's not, actually not. So we have to be very careful. And we have to consider genuine development of uh, fisheries by coastal developing countries. And uh, for that purpose, uh, we have been, you know, helping the countries through various means, like uh, providing a fund for uh, fishery development, or, uh, you know, the, uh, actually, my personal opinion is that, uh, you know, the, because uh, this is a kind of zero-sum game, the fishery resource is limited, so if you want to increase, somebody must decrease, then I think uh, it should be a uh, developing countries decrease the catch amount, if developing countries want to increase. But uh, this type of transition should take place uh, gradually slowly, because we have fishermen who are involved in fisheries. And uh, actually, the number of, uh, let's say, long liners flagged to Japan have been decreasing and decreasing. So uh, probably this tendency will continue. Then perhaps uh, you, know, the, you can increase your fishing uh, you know, opportunity uh, in, in return for our decrease of fishing opportunity. But this type of thing should take place gradually in order to alleviate, alleviate economic difficulties of uh, fishermen from developed countries. So please understand this point. Other, otherwise, you know, I fully really support the development of fishermen in your country. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, that, you raised a lot of important points, and in fact, I think we many of us will agree with, with, with some of the points you raised. And, and if we gave the impression there hasn't been any progress, um, there has been progress. For some of the stocks, for some of the species, progress has not been fast enough. And that, that's what we need to really focus on. 
And I'm just wondering if any of the points raised, any of the speakers or panelists would like to comment or respond in any way. Okay, and then we will get to other questions, commenters. Um, briefly, because I would like obviously others to make comments. I would say um, respectfully the only issue of loan lines, um, firstly, I would say that yes, the role of Japan in actually driving, um, before I get to the lines, the role of Japan in driving an outcome at IATTC this year for the first time for measuring for Pacific Blue Bin was, um, was critical and uh, we're very pleased to see that happen. On long lines, I understand completely the challenge around bringing people to the acceptance of the need for higher observer coverage, but I think at this point in time, when we look at the potential impacts from long line fisheries for shark species, the level of this reporting, um, and also alongside that, the available technology to help us um, overcome the challenges of putting observers um, in human form on those vessels. I think we can't accept 5% and wait too much longer. I think we have to see an increase in the observer rate on long lines if we're going to actually address both the data questions, the ecosystem impacts, and start to get effective catch management in place. Thank you. Anyone else which wish to comment? Okay, go ahead. I'll try not to spill it. Thanks, so I'll just be um, brief. Just uh, in response to some of the comments made by Alta, 